So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm so delighted uh, uh, to have this uh, webinar today. It's actually the sixth in a series uh, that the Center for Urban Policy and Governance um, is organizing. Um, it focuses on land, housing, and property rights, tracing policy shifts and emerging issues in India and the global south. Um, and this webinar series is being organized in partnership with the Omidyar Network India. Um, and uh, let me first quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm Lalita Kamath, and I'm the chairperson of the Center for Urban Policy and Governance um, at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. Um, so it's wonderful. Um, to have all of you present. Um, it's a really exciting lineup um, that we have today for the Land Fictions Roundtable. I'm in fact going to begin giving a, a very short, really truncated um, uh, set of bios um, to introduce the speakers um, for this evening. Um, the more extended bios have already been sent out in the invite, so please forgive me for shortening so that we get to actually hear each of them talk for longer, and we hope that we will have a lot of questions and comments. So right from the get-go, feel free to type in your comments in the chat box, your questions, uh, but we will also be keeping time for um, Q&A at the end. Um, so let me begin uh, by... Uh, introducing our first speaker, uh, we have D. Asher Gertner, who's an associate professor in the Department of Geography at Rutgers University. Um, in addition to co-editing the book that we're going to be talking about today, Land Fictions, with Bob Lake, he is also the co-editor of Future Proof, Security, Aesthetics, and the Management of Life, and also the author of Rule by Aesthetics, World-Class City Making in Delhi. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome you, Asha. Our second uh, focused speaker today is Robert Lake, Robert W. Lake, let me not forget. Um, uh, he's a professor emeritus in the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Um, he's also a member of the graduate faculties in geography and urban planning, also from Rutgers University in Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, Bob's current work explores the politics of urban land markets, collaborative and community-based planning, the financialization of public policy, and pragmatist approaches to the politics of knowledge production. Welcome, Bob, and it's a particular pleasure to have you here, um, given that uh, so many years ago you were one of, one of the members of my dissertation committee, so really delighted to have you here. Um, our third um, speaker for this evening is Michael Levy. Mike is an associate professor of sociology at Johns Hopkins University. He's the author of Dispossession Without Development, Land Grabs in Neoliberal India. He's also the co-editor of Agrarian Marxism and Rural Land Dispossession in China and India. Welcome, Michael. Sai Balakrishnan is our next speaker. She's an assistant professor of city and regional planning and global metropolitan studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she's the author most recently of Shareholder Cities, Land Transformations Along Urban Corridors in India. Um, Sai, such a pleasure to have you here um, in person as well, uh, since you're in Bangalore and you're smiling. Uh, <laughs> and finally, and certainly not the last, uh, we have our anchor, our conversation anchor for this evening, Hussein Indurwala. Yes, Hussein is a teacher and urban researcher um, he teaches planning theory, housing, and humanities at the Kamla Rahija Vidyanidhi Institute for Architecture, or KRBIA, in Mumbai. His research work has focused on urban history, infrastructure planning, the politics of land and housing, and sustainable transport. Welcome, Hussein. Um, and with that, I'm done with the uh, heavy duties of uh, introducing all of you. Um, Hussein, I'm going to hand over the mic to you. Please tell us a little bit about the format and get the webinar going. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lalita, for the introductions. And thank you also for inviting me and very kindly sending me a copy of this uh, uh, excellent book as a gift, uh, which I shall keep. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so, yeah, that's the one. Um, 
Okay, so as a format, uh, let's first get the editors of the book, uh, Asher and Robert, to talk a little bit about the book's central ideas and questions. Um, now, both of you, Asher and Robert, have also contributed chapters to the book, so it would be nice if you can also touch upon your case studies in your presentations as well. Um, after that, we would probably uh, do a little bit of discussion, and then we'll invite Mike, uh, Michael and uh, Sai to present their chapters. Um, and then we'll have another small round of um, discussion. Maybe I'll ask a couple of questions and then we'll open it up for the audience for a QA. and a Is that uh, okay? Does it work for everyone? So, okay, excellent. Thanks. Um, so, Asher and uh, Robert, over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Hussein and Lalita. Bob, do you want to to begin, or shall I? I can't remember what we decided as far as uh, order. I think we'll uh, probably speak over each other at various points. In any case, but I think you're you're off to a good start. Why don't you keep going? <laughs> okay, in that case. Um, <clears throat> well, once again, thank you, Hussein, for agreeing to anchor the conversation for um, for for engaging the book picking it up and promising to keep it at least. <laughs> uh, thank you, especially to Lalita um, uh, for inviting us and insisting that we do this. Sometimes, you know, coming and giving a talk or giving a, a webinar, I should say, on a book that's already out and an edited book in this case that began as a set of conversations in 2015 um, requires a little bit of backtracking, but it's really a nice occasion to have a chance to rethink some of the concepts to invite conversation with you all. Um, and thanks to others behind the scenes, um, Ratula and others, comrades at TIS and part of the network for inviting us. And of course, thanks to Sai and Mike for, for, for coming along for the, for the ride and the show. <laughs> You'll be the, the main events, I'm quite sure. Um, so what I wanted to do maybe is, um, because it is an edited edited book, um, I meant to have a, um, a, um, a a slideshow to just show it, but here it is. Um, and I'll click to the table of contents in a little bit, just so you can see the, the architecture of the book a little bit. What I want to do is just give a little bit of a, a background to the origins of the book, the ideas that motivated it, and then some of the kind of bigger conceptual work that we were trying to do and bring the, the chapters together. I think probably Bob might reflect a little bit more on our central engagement with the content concept of, of fictions and perhaps think through the way that we use and also in certain ways don't use the insights of the political economist Carl Polanyi um, in, in the text. So that just to give you a sense of where we're going. But so the book began, as I said before, as a conference in 2015 with ongoing conversations a few years after that that was motivated at the time by this shared concern with accelerating processes of land dispossession in both rural and urban contexts around the world. And we were especially struck in our conversations by the kind of confluence of languages and logics that were used to justify both urban and rural land commodification across contexts in the global north, the US in particular, where Bob's work is located, and in the global south. On the one hand, we saw how rural land grabs were being justified increasingly as necessary to close what were being termed in the languages of the World Bank, for example, as closing agricultural yield gaps or gaps between current levels of agricultural productivity, right in context with continuing fragmented land holdings, a strong peasantry, for example. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, this potential to push agricultural yields uh, much higher once those lands would ostensibly be privatized and turned over to corporate agriculture. So this kind of agri closing agricultural yield gaps language on the one hand, much of which accelerated um, in the wake of the mid 2000s commodity boom, but that really continued through international development discourse framed in terms of food self-sufficiency of the export potential for commodity cash commodities and from the perspective of financial capital in the wake of the 2008 global meltdown, treating rural land as a kind of safe haven for global capital to park assets, right? As a kind of rural land as a safe haven or as a stable asset class as it was increasingly framed. So that's the kind of rural conversation we saw going on. And on the other hand, there was a kind of global discourse 
a kind of confluence of discourses around the need for land monetization and more recently around land financialization, describing the potential for cities in South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular to monetize public or customary land to generate revenues for national development needs, right? Sell state-owned land, remove squatters, remove other unproductive land uses, and voila, infrastructure growth and urban renewal could be bankrolled. So the argument went. So in both contexts, rural and urban, there was the story being told of the need to kind of sacrifice old land uses and the classes that had historically relied upon them to make way for a kind of glorious future of sorts. Right? So it's not a new story, but the fundamental role of land in particular as a new vehicle for a kind of rent-driven growth was what we were seeing kind of co this confluence of conversations and logics circulating around. At the same time, we were struck by resonances in the languages that communities of the dispossessed and activists and critics were using to challenge this process of land commodification internationally. This was the language of land global land grabbing or sometimes framed as the new enclosures. Um, that was moving again between urban and rural contexts, but without much specific attention to the differences or connections between the urban and the rural. And so this led to a kind of observation that even while international development institutions were thinking about re land relationally between the city and the country, that a lot of the academic and policy debate remained really siloed into these respective camps of urban studies and agrarian studies. So on the one hand, there was this like rich, gentrification and rent gap and right to the city kind of conversation that had these powerful tools for challenging urban land loss, concepts like spatial relegation, spatial justice, racial banishment, informality had emerged, but we said, thought hadn't really taken seriously um, what Shared Chari provocatively called for, you know, much earlier, a kind of need to bring the agrarian question to town. How, in other words, we were thinking, do we think of questions like customary land use, legal pluralism, and diverse land tenures, these concepts that had been really central to the agrarian studies literature in an urban setting? On the other hand, there was this agrarian, rich Marxian tradition of agrarian studies with it brought sharp attention to processes of em eminent domain, land grabbing, agricultural industrialization, and the forms of dispossession and land loss associated with that but they hadn't really taken up concepts related to the urbanization of the countryside that was simultaneously taking place. So this is what brought us to Polanyi. Bob and I, I think were sitting and we were both reading Polanyi in different seminars or classes we were teaching at the time. And we came to you know, the great transformation where Polanyi introduces this concept of fictitious commodities. And alongside what he called the commodity fiction, he introduced this idea, right, of the double movement of capitalism. This idea that liberal economic pressures to disembed the three fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money from social relations would always lead to these kind of spontaneous protective counter movements. And a lot of the rural and urban literature, especially around the idea of the right to the city in urban context and around the new land wars in the countryside, were often framed in terms of this kind of double movement. Like where is the double movement or where is the double ma movement manifesting? And how might we think of linkages between urban and rural processes of land contestation? So we took the idea of the commodity fiction, but we wanted to expand it out to consider land fictions on a more literal, in a more literal sense, to think really about the social stories that organize land commodification programs. And so we started with Polanyi's land fiction, um, right? And I think Bob might say more about how we thought of playing with that. But part of the idea was to actually take fictions again, kind of literally to think about the social stories that are narrated to sort of justify um, processes of land commodification and associated dispossession. And we wanted to think really about the, um, so like just to give some, just uh, uh, so, some examples, like we were thinking in the context of these resonances between rural and urban of, for example, um, like there's kind of fictions we noted embedded within some of the core concepts of development that we have. Emerging market is a kind of story, a fiction of sorts, a story of the future of a market that is yet to, but will inevitably emerge. The idea of an undercapitalized resource, very much a part of this land grabbing conversation is a kind of fiction of a resource that sets up a plot of sorts, a narrative structure, 
expecting a transformation, right? The idea of an undercapitalized or underutilized resource is in certain ways setting up the, the space for a protagonist into the enter the plot and change the story somehow, right? Perhaps a mining corporation that taps into the unrealized potential of uh, a, a land concession or a plantation crop that come along can come along and make use of an underutilized soil, a fertile soil or something. So the same um, for like you know basic descriptive terms like agroecological potential had is a, is a sort of story of sorts. And so we wanted to play with thinking through these implicit stories and then actual kind of fabulations or tales of social, be of social betterment that are used to justify processes of land commodification and dispossession comparatively between country and city, between North and South. And so the book is kind of organized transnationally and comparatively so that each chapter more or less to some extent directly or indirectly looks at terms like this, right? Like underutilized potential or, um, uh, you know, possible efficiency gains or the idea of land as an underutilized asset. Or else those chapters look at specific tales or stories of land's social better betterment and considers how these stories and narrative structures are really wrapped up with particular kinds of value projects, right? Projects aimed at extracting value via rent. Um, and then, you know, the book, you know, as an edited book, how those all kind of hang together is uh, an open question that we leave um, to readers in certain ways. But th that was the kind of prompt, if you will, that we gave to contributing authors and everybody ran with it in different directions, but really thinking through the sort of power of narrative and tale in the process of market making and thinking about that, not just as a kind of extension of market making technique or economics, but is really central to the enterprise of, 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 of the, the kind of conjuring of worlds of property, this kind of central apparatus through which, you know, capital markets work. I hope that helps and didn't wasn't too long and meandering. <laughs> Bob, I'm sure you have important things to add that I missed. Okay, so I think by now I should have learned um, not to try to follow Asher. And, and, and Asher, you actually gave me an opportunity to avoid that mistake, but I wasn't quick enough to take it. So I'm going to have to try to uh, follow up on those uh, really insightful comments. Uh, let, uh, without without trying to repeat too much of what you've already said, uh, let me let me also add my thanks to Lalitha for organizing this and to uh, my my colleagues Michael and Sai who will be speaking about their chapters uh, and contributing to this conversation and to all of the contributors of chapters to the book and to the original conference that uh, Asher described. Uh, this has been a, a very illuminating ride for me, uh, introducing me to some new um, concepts and, and ways of thinking about these issues and uh, situating me in places around the world that I otherwise would never have visited, uh, even, even through the text. Um, and so it's been a really informative and, and valuable experience for me. And, and thank you, everybody here who's... Um, uh, tuned into this conversation. I wanted to use uh, just my, my my few minutes here um, to meditate a little bit, a little briefly about the terms in the title of the book, right? Land fictions and the subtitle, the commodification of land in the city and the country. Uh, and so clearly the, the book is focused on this, this phenomenon that we call land, and in particular, the version of land that takes the form of a commodity. Um, and as indicated in the subtitle of the book, The Commodification of Land in City and Country, uh, a focus on the process through which land becomes commodified, the process through which land, which clearly precedes any semblance of a market, precedes and exceeds any semblance of a market, 
becomes transformed into a marketable commodity. Why this happens, how this happens, with what consequences, across a broad variety of contexts and settings, urban and rural, global north, global south, um, and how in turn, looking at these processes of commodification of land might help us to think about alternative, uh, alternatives to the transformation of land into a marketable commodity. Why are we doing this and what else might we be able to do uh, that might be a better idea? Uh, so the land fictions in our title uh, is our name for that process of land commodification. Now we don't mean fiction in the sense of false or untrue or the opposite of fact. We mean fiction or fictional in the sense of constructed or composed in a way that then becomes fact or takes on the appearance of fact. Um, and we take the idea of land fictions, as uh, Asher mentioned, from Carl Polanyi's discussion of fictitious commodities. In particular, Polanyi was concerned with land, labor, and money. Commodities that are not originally produced for production and exchange, but are transformed and I use the passive voice here, are transformed into commodities so that they can be bought and sold in the market. Writing, writing those land fictions is not substantial, uh, requires, requires constructing a storyline. This is our premise in the, in the introduction of the book and, the, and I think the, the guiding idea in the chapters. Uh, writing land fictions requires constructing a storyline in which and through which land is transformed into a marketable commodity. And the writing of land fiction is not substantially different from writing, let's say, literary fiction. All the conventions of writing literary fiction apply equally to the writing of land fiction. Conventions of narrative, image, character, plot, vocabulary, grammar. And just as with writing literary fiction, we aspire to Shakespeare and Milton. And most often what we get is pulp fiction and wooden prose. It's banal, it's formulaic, uh, it's writing that invokes uh, basic instincts rather than reaching for higher sentiments and elevated values, uh, and that reproduces often cliched plot lines that militate against imaginative experiments and new ways of seeing and being. The storylines of land fictions are narrated through those institutional arrangements legislative enactments, legal proceedings, discursive pronouncements, and material practices through which land is rendered commodifiable and exchangeable in the market for the singular purpose of extracting and realizing value from land. That's the basic premise of the, of the book and the, and the premise that we explore throughout the chapters. An important element in the construction of land fictions is the characters in the story who move the narrative forward. Theories don't act, people do. And land fictions enroll subjects as characters in their story. Land fictions construct subjects and subjectivities that then act in accordance with the requirements of the plot. So just very, very quickly, two, two points that I think follow from this way of approaching the idea of land fictions. On the one hand, the storylines of land fiction seek to portray an inevitability. They appear to be teleological, so that the outcome of the story seems to be prefigured in its, uh, in its inception. So we can reach what we think 
is a satisfying conclusion. When you read a novel, you want to follow along with the characters in the plot and arrive at the conclusion that makes sense from the way the narrative is written. And uh, the meaning, what, uh, we can reach what we think is a satisfying conclusion, meaning one that ratifies or reproduces our presuppositions. We take comfort in that familiarity, in the reassuring sense that we know how to play the game and our winning is ratified by the scale of financial profit we can extract from following the storyline that has been laid out for us. But then the second point follows from the first, which was, is that that inevitability, that comfort, that familiarity, that sense of inevitability is a mirage because the story is continuously being written. Take the story can always veer off course, take a new unanticipated direction, a new character can appear on the scene, the plot can take a twist and surprise endings are always possible. So because the story is always being written anew, we don't always know how the story will end. And this is my final point then. Across the 12 case study chapters in land fictions, across the 12 stories of commodification of land in city and country, we resist the urge to generalize. There is no singular storyline repeated across the 12 cases. In fact, the variety of stories told in each of those 12 cases is precisely the important point of the book. The differences, not the similarities, the specificities and contextualities and contingencies is more, are more important than a simplifying overall general generalization. There is no higher power, no deus ex machina, no deterministic structure that imposes its authorial power over passive characters that populate the tale of land fictions. You have to follow the story as it unfolds in each case. If you wanna know how the story ends, read the book. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Asher and Robert, for a very um, interesting and rich uh, introduction and outline. And uh, I don't think the story really ends, uh, but I did read land fiction with uh, land fictions with a lot of interest, and it makes for really insightful reading. Um, so um, it brings into focus an issue that is at the heart of much of the policy debates and political struggles around contemporary urban and regional development, and this it does according to me at two levels. First, by making the link or drawing the link between neoliberal economic policies and the conception of land that enables or inhibits its supply for market-oriented development. And then at a deeper level, by once again focusing our attention on the more fundamental questions that need to be asked about what land is, how it is valued, how it is owned and managed, how it is embedded or disembedded in non-economic institutions, what is at stake in the concept of land's use, and hence what is often meant by land reform or liberalization. So in the way the book is framed and as a collection, it is uh, refreshing on many levels. First, while uh, its framing and scope is global, uh, it's not national or regional. And as a collection, it highlights the different dynamics as Robert pointed out of development in different parts of the world. This allows for a closer reading of different traditions of land ownership, tenure, and policy in each of the case studies. And therefore, as a book, it moves away from the uh, popular trend of con contrasting a more generalized depiction of one part of the world with more particular descriptions of another. Secondly, and similarly, I think the analytic of land commodification helps move away from an urban-rural dichotomy to emphasize the territorial dimensions of capitalist form of growth by highlighting property formation and broader tr transformations of territory and landscape. What is therefore interesting uh, is that 
and differential conditions, consequences, and responses to the organizing logic of the commodity form provides a valuable starting point for comparative urban research, which is one of the great uh, strengths of the book, really. Uh, and third, notwithstanding the title, uh, the book brings attention to both the crude fiction of treating land as a commodity and the brutal facts of the commodification process. Um, it is therefore a collection that combines political philosophy, social analysis, and policy critique, representing a shared political ground while accommodating theoretically divergent perspectives. Uh, the various chapters of the book have very different emphasis and interpretations of the book's central provocation, and I hope we'll be able to open some of these up during the discussion. So as I said, while reading the book, I was intrigued by the debate that is internal to the book itself. And I, was, I, I thought it would be nice to organize this as a debate around some of these. So while my first few comments and questions will be directed to Asher and Bob, it will also be great to get Michael and Sai to come in and uh, you know, at any point and respond. So, so to start, um, just for those who haven't got a chance to see the book, uh, the book draws from the concept of uh, Karl Polanyi's uh, book, uh, The Great Transformation, written in 1944. Um, and Polanyi's text, um, I, when I, um, I remember reading it, it's full of memorable quotes. Uh, the most famous, of course, is the, uh, is the one where he talks about the self-adjusting market as a stark utopia that if realized, would annihilate the human and natural substance of society and transform our environment into a wilderness. It's, uh, you know, it's something that is really uh, evocative. Um, so in his famous thesis, Polanyi described market society as one that affects a clear institutional separation into an economic and political sphere, where society itself is subordinated to the requirements of the economic system. The resulting, what he calls market economy, um, uh, is one where all elements of industry, including the very substance of society, land, labor, and money, is subordinated to the laws of the market through the commodity form. But, Polanyi continues, land, unlike uh, land, like labor and money, is obviously not a commodity. Uh, land, he says, is only another name for nature and is, produced for, is not produced for sale. Thus, the commodity description is entirely fictitious. So the, the main point of contention in the book, um, uh, uh, Land Fictions, Asher and Robert, I, uh, I felt, uh, seems to be the debate between fiction as a narrative invention with fiction as mystification, or in other words, between the performative power of fiction to produce political economic effects versus fiction within an adversarial framework that appeal to interests deeply intertwined with material forces. Now, to conclude that something is a fiction requires some criteria of what is real. In your introduction, you locate the book in the terrain of literary studies to consider fiction um, not as a way of representing the real, but rather as a way of signifying a set of relations with the real. And therefore, one must attend to not what is obscured by a conception, but what its significatory powers entail. Later, you add that quote, the performance of commodity fictions enables and comes prior to the production in a market economy. And these draw willing subjects seeking to remake the world through modified relationships and the roles that they promise to enact. Um, it follows from this uh, that building a less commodified world requires us to quote, tell better stories and to be able to tell what makes stories travel and stick. So what I felt was this is a very strong claim, one where ideas tend to determine interests. Uh, in contrast to, say, a more barbarian notion of elective affinity that posits a contingent relationship between ideas and interests, or a more Marxist view where ideas are assumed to be kind of rationalizations for interests. So to my mind, two concerns arise here, which, which would be nice to, for, uh, nice to get your thoughts on both of them. First, conceptually speaking, what would be the conditions that would enable some stories to become powerful operating principles? Uh, while other stories fall by the wayside. And second, that if building a less commodified world requires us to tell better stories, what makes some stories better than others if we exclude veracity or referentiality as a criteria? Thanks, Hussein, for those um, really generous thoughts and questions. Um, Bob, uh, do you want to jump in or? 
Well, just very briefly, um, I, I would, I, I guess I would continue the metaphor of literary fictions uh, where the process of land fiction entails an invitation to join in the, in, in the story, right? There's a, there's a structure of belief and understanding uh, and, and conceptual uh, framing that informs a set of institutions and practices um, that then enroll subjects and participants to engage in the story that aligns with the, uh, the institutions that have been, have, again, I'm using passive voice here, have been established in order to enact the narrative of commodification. And uh, what all of us, and I use that term collectively, um, when we engage in market transactions, and, in spe and specifically in market transactions concerning land, uh, willingly or not, or wittingly or not, uh, agree to become characters in that narrative. And uh, this is not a matter of truth versus fiction. This is a matter of a, of a set of constructs that enable the process of value extraction from land through a process of commodification so that we all engage, we all again collectively, uh, when we uh, are economic actors, when we uh, engage in market processes, um, uh, we populate that narrative. Um, and uh, whether it's, it doesn't matter whether it is a, a, a narrative of truth or fiction, it is a narrative in which we engage as, as collective subjects uh, because we are then now dependent on the operation of those institutional arrangements and legal frameworks and all of the operational mechanisms through which that narrative is performed. Uh, we are dependent on participating along the lines of that uh, according to that storyline, uh, uh, because our alternative is, who knows, go off into the wilderness and live off the land, or be, you know, uh, uh, try to enact a, a, and 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 author a, a, an alternative narrative that does not depend on commodification and market exchange, and that, of course, is a uh, overwhelming. Uh, overwhelmingly difficult challenge because of the pervasiveness of those institutional arrangements and their underlying presuppositions. So we all willingly or, or, or not uh, uh, play along. We become subjects and characters in that narrative. Um, is there an alternative? Of course. Right? And I think that was the, uh, my ending point in my comments. We don't there is always, because the process, because the story is continually being enacted and continually being written and rewritten in specific contexts, there is always the possibility of rewriting it differently. Uh, that entails a political project and a political agenda uh, to mobilize uh, that set of alternative understandings and the institutional arrangements that those alternatives would require. Uh, and I don't for a minute underestimate the difficulty of uh, uh, establishing that alternative narrative in practice, as, as we see in all of the so-called utopian experiments that have uh, emerged and flourished and failed uh, over time. Um, but the possibility is always there if we can be politically astute enough to figure out how to do it. Yeah, thanks. I, I think I'll just add, um, I, th I think that this point, this tension you're pointing out, Hussein, between what you call the, the, the kind of conventions of thinking of things in terms of mystification, right, which you might think of like as ideological, as somehow related in a set of um, relations that are unreal or um, 
or, uh, untrue or or damaging in some way on the one hand, and then the what you called I think the performative power of naming. I think I think actually part of what we're trying to do is to refuse that that separation, and I think in this regard. We're actually departing from Polanyi in some 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 clear ways because for for Polanyi, commodity the commodity fiction was as you noted it's he calls it a crude fiction a kind of founding premise of capitalist relations right he said you needed landed property to organize industry and in this sense it's kind of the ideological underpinning or mystification that subtends or underlies capitalist relations it's a kind of mental construct almost the idea of land nature itself being sellable um and in this sense it, it is a kind of mystification it was false um but when we say that fictions need not fiction when we use fictions we don't mean the opposite of the real we're not saying that they have no basis in the real. We're saying that they shape the terms on which reality is registered and given meaning. And in this sense, I think we are departing from Polanyi because Polanyi, he has this kind of, Polanyi I know, actively tried to distance himself from, from Marx in particular. And he has this kind of throwaway footnote at one point where he kind of dismisses the idea of commodity fetishism. And I think we are not so quick to do so. I think we're holding on to the power of the fetish. So whereas, you know, um, or that's my reading of it, at least maybe Bob disagrees. And there, there are definitely tensions uh, with, within the book in different chapters. But I think, you know, Polanyi, we might say his idea of, a, of land fiction or commodity fiction as a crude fiction is really emphasizing, um, you know, lots of people, lots of critics of the concept have framed it as that he has this kind of ontological approach to land, treating land as um, as as this kind of given set of conditions that can never sort of achieve that it is un the, the you know it's like truth conditions of being a commodity can never be met. So therefore, right, it can only be treated as if it's a commodity, and therefore that's a mystification or an unreality of sorts. Right, it's defined by it can't be moved. It's not movable. It has a, a fixed land has a fixity in place. He equates land with nature. And um, unlike other commodities, right, he says it can't be produced, as you noted. And I think we're, we're trying to do in certain ways uh, is to reintroduce this attention to commodity fetishism. Um, taking fictions seriously uh, as not ontological givens, but as powerful rhetorical devices and organizing principles um, that that we try to bring back in, um, in noting that the, the fetish of land of landed property is is all around us that the ascription of these kind of fantastical or mystical or metaphysical qualities of, of property is precisely what allows the idea of property to travel and capture imaginations um, and so the work of mystification is only achieved performatively through these individual storylines or that's the conditions of its reproduction i think that's probably closer to what we say so to come to your question of how we tell better stories i think in certain ways it's about constructing or finding other ways other, other kinds of relationships to the real you know like in really simply put that could be like thinking of how we construct trust constructs construct stories that either um challenge dominant narratives right like i'm looking at um audience members who have worked on this in really rich ways so like you know i mean the babasker's work if we're thinking of like the transformation of urban property is about building a city defined by civility, right? Or like how you construct a, a, a civil city through land marketization and these processes of, of, of uh, letting, letting the market work, sort of in other words, then we, we tell stories about how that's, that's, that's not what, that it's actually uncivil. It's producing forms of incivility through those very mechanisms. Or it's about finding, uh, you know, narratives and stories that emphasize other use value attributes of property or of, of land as other than property. Um, and that's what I think a lot of the, the chapters are, are more concretely, I hope, trying to do, recognizing the violences of these dominant storylines with that we're all very familiar with through neoliberalism and global financialization and these sort of big, big, big stories, but then thinking about within that the forms of contestation and the individual struggles that demonstrate 
either if if not the impossibility, then the real messiness and um, uh, and alternatives to the the end plot of the big commodity win, if you will. I would just real quickly add to that that I think Polanyi's point is that the the reality of land exceeds the boundaries of its commodification. That there that when we commodify land, we um, we, we measure it and we um, uh, delimit it and we uh, assign it a, a deed and a title and turn it into property uh, that where the property and the deed is what's exchanged, not the land itself. But the land still has all of these other characteristics that exceed the bounds of its commodification and, and transformation into property. And it's those other elements of land, it's, 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 it's biology and chemistry and geology and aesthetic qualities and uh, personal and cultural connections and uh, uh, anthropological uh, meanings uh, of land that uh, are not uh, encompassed within the commodity form that continue to enact uh, effects in the world. Um, and, and that um, uh, non-contiguity is the source of the, uh, uh, the, 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 I guess, disaster that uh, Polanyi predicts when we only think of land in its commodity form. Uh, that we we uh, construct all of these institutional arrangements and practices, uh, believing that land is only a commodity when it's out there doing and having these effects uh, outside of the commodity uh, process, but that we, and that we ignore that at our peril. Okay, um, I think we are also um, we are running short of time. I think uh, we have. Um, um, Michael and Sai, who uh, we had to present. So let's um, have um, Michael and Sai present their chapters, both of which examine the politics of uh, land commodification in India and really rich with uh, lots of empirical insights. So, um, Michael, over to you. Uh, first, thank you to Lalita and Hussein for you know organizing this and, and for um, Asher and Bob for organizing the conference and the book, which um, I found it as a great opportunity to really work through kind of how I see um, Polanyi, you know, and I think a lot of us became interested in Polanyi in the 2000s, you know, when there's all these movements against neoliberalism and globalization and they're kind of, you know, um, uh, and they don't seem to be sort of like narrow exploitation labor struggles, right? You have movements against land grabs and water privatizations and, you know, and, and, and IMF structural adjustment, right? And, and so that moment sort of Polanyi's idea of the double movements had some kind of um, at least superficial resonance, right? This seems like a double movement. So Polanyi's argument, right? I don't really need to lay it out again since Asher and Bob did as well, but the argument that of course, you know, uh, a kind of disembedding of the market, the attempt to create a laissez-faire, you know, uh, market involves the commodification of the fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money. These lead to social dislocations. The social dislocations leads to counter movements that kind of lead to a kind of re-embedding of the market or decommodification. Now, of course, there's lots of problems with Polanyi, right? Um, one, I mean, it's totally functionalist, right? So he just kind of assumes that counter movements emerge and succeed. And the second is he has a totally organic, really Durkheimian conception of society that can't deal with power of any, any kind, class, caste, gender, none of it's there, right? And so how do kind of counter movements, you know, how, how does this kind of movement against the market kind of pass through all those kinds of inequalities and, and what does that do to the politics of, right? There's no political sociology actually of counter movements, right? So um, there's lots of problems with it, which is actually when I sort of look at, you know, in, in my efforts to analyze land dispossession and its drivers and its politics, don't really use Polanyi that much, right? Because it's honestly a mess when you get past that sort of superficial resonance of the double movement. Um, but I do think there's one thing that's really of value here. And I do think at least sort of to understand the kind of um, to understanding dispossession, to understanding land politics. And I do think it's this idea of land as a fictitious commodity, but I do have a different interpretation than, you know, Bob and Asher. And it has much less to do with narrative um, and it's much more of a sociological than literary interpretation. Um, 
I think Polanyi argues, at least this is the, you can draw a few interpretations out, but this is the one I find useful, um, which is that um, when, when, when Polanyi says land is a fictitious commodity because it's not produced for sale in the market, that's not because it's just inherently some different thing, but it's because, you know, land obviously pre-exists any attempt to create a market. And what matters about that is that it's embedded in non-market social relations, institutions, and values that have to be overcome if it's going to be turned into a commodity, right? And so in a sense, all those social relations are obstacles to capital accumulation, and they have to be overcome, right? And that helps us understand all the things that states do, right? For example, to transform land into a commodity, forms of state action, and of course, forms of dispossession. Um, and the and I, I don't talk about it in the article, but also it helps us to understand things like non-state forms of coercion, like land mafias and sort of what they're doing to transform land um, into a commodity. And so what this actually does is fill this hole in a lot of theories of dispossession, like Harvey and others who, you know, it's really, uh, Harvey's ideas are really about why, you know, you need an outlet to value capital. He doesn't actually have a theory of why land needs to be dispossessed, right, to um, kind of prop up, you know, profitability to provide an outlet for capital and so on. And I think Polanyi actually fills that, that hole. Um, the, the problem, of course, though, is that, you know, doing that, um, it's really dispossession, not commodification that creates counter movements in this way, right? So it's not just sort of land titling, but it's more often land dispossession that creates counter movements. But counter movements can also not succeed. It cannot emerge. And they often don't actually succeed in re-embedding the market or decommodifying land. So that's why the sort of title of my you know, chapter is fictitious, but not utopian. This sort of idea that transforming land into commodity is utopian just flies in the face of everything we're seeing, which is the intensified commodification of everything, which yes, creates dislocation, social and ecological. Yes, it creates counter movements, but it doesn't actually lead to re-embedding or decommodification, which is the real dystopia that we're living in right now. So then the rest of the chapter just kind of put some illustration on empirical illustration on this using my case study in Rajasthan. Um, and I just should add that, you know, what, it key, what, what that Polanyi keys us into, right, is the historical processes that are necessary, often involving the state and force to kind of transform land from a non-commodity into a commodity. Um, and that has a lot of variation, of course, regionally. So I'm just gonna kind of illustrate it in one particular region, but I think it's illustrative of the types of processes involved. So my case study was in Rajasthan outside of Jaipur. And, you know, in 1947, the land was a jugir. Today, it is a special economic zone in which, you know, as much of a private property and land exists as capitalism, capitalism needs to exist. The land is freely bought and sold. Um, and it really provides an open circuit, right? Uh, an open field for the circulation of capital in Harvey's words. Okay, so what happened in between um, to make this transformation happen? Well, one is you had post-independence land reforms. And of course, look, I realize this is Rajasthan, right? So this history <laughs> is much more recent, right? Than in um, directly ruled parts of India. Um, so land reform in the post-independence period uh, creates land titles. It makes land alienable. Of course, it makes land also very unequally distributed um, by class and caste and of course, gender. Um, but that's the sort of first step, right? Is land reform actually took these took tenants and made them landholders and started to create a title and took a long time, cadastral surveys take a long time and so on. Okay, but at the end of that process, land can be sold. Um, but there's still a lot of obstacles to land being treated as a commodity. You know, they have all these types of Neruvian regulations, of course, around land conversions, around urban, you know, uh, sorry, rural land ceilings and, and urban land ceilings. Um, and there's limited demand, you know, and the title, the titling process is still messy and so on. But, you know, there's also not much demand, right? This is a kind of area, there's no kind of urban demand for land um, in this area. Okay, so this is what in the 90s, right? As the sort of India transitions and there's all this kind of interest in land and real estate is liberalized and so on and so on. Um, then what very quickly follows, right? Is a series of policies that like make land conversions more easy that uh, lift those land ceilings and, and so on and so on. Um, so that sort of, is one, another stage, right? Where it kind of facilitates, it sort of lifts, it deregulates land. Um, but of course then, even then, um, it is impossible <laughs> uh, to 
acquire large contiguous plots of land for capital, right? So land, the land markets are still, first you have small holders and you know, the titles, there's a, you're gonna find at least a few titles that are very difficult in there. You have joint family property, which is, you know, creates a lot of uh, difficulty to sort of purchase land on the market. And so dispossession of course, is the way to overcome that obstacle. And so very quickly after liberalization, you see states transform into what I call land broker states, and they're dispossessing land no longer just for public sector infrastructure, but for any kind of private real estate purposes and so on. So that's sort of coup de gras that actually transforms, uh, that, there's, that is able to create really a fully capitalist land market. All right. Um, now we can still say that, look, land exceeds that and so on, but that's fine. Capitalism can live with that. It's, it's, a, it's a commodity. Um, and, and of course, this dispossession elsewhere across India for SEZs and so on um, is what created all these land, one of the things that created all these kind of land wars across um, India. And my case is one where, um, you know, they uh, averted a land, uh, you know, a kind of resistance movement by giving farmers kind of small plots of land that, you know, had all this value. I uh, kind of really most, mostly just individualized the farmers um, and kind of broke any possibility for solidarity as sort of large farmers, you know, did very well. And mostly the poor and lower caste really sold their land very quickly and cheaply. They wound up being proletarianized and food insecure. And the whole result of this was um, a lot of social and ecological dislocation, massive inequalities, development failure. The upper caste did very well for the most part. And the Dalits were mostly proletarianized and did much, much worse in this whole process, um, but there is no counter movement. So the counter movement was uh, dissipated or averted by kind of absorbing farmers in onto the terrain of commodification. So creating a class compromise, if you will, on the terrain of com commodification, which of course is what Lara was trying to do on a national level now, whether it's doing that, it's not even being implemented, but um, it was an attempt to sort of, um, you know, so the point here is simply that counter movements may not emerge. They certainly may not um, succeed. The social and dislocations, ecological dislocations follow, as Polanyi would predict. Um, but um, but the uh, but this is kind of keeps going, right? So the idea that this is utopian is, I think, um, wrong. But nonetheless, there's value, I think, in this concept of land as a fictitious commodity. Um, and it really does fill this hole and help attune us to all the sort of forms of force and, and fraud and state action that are kind of necessary to transform land into a commodity. Now, to understand the actual, you know, uh, politics of dispossession requires a kind of comparative sociology, political sociology of dispossession. You know, why do resistance merge here or there, you know, and this kind of agrarian social structure that has this caste configuration, but not here. And then, and then taking into account sort of the political histories of different villages. So it's work that I've tried to develop elsewhere. Polanyi does not provide that political sociology whatsoever. He can't, he does attune us to the need for it. And I would say that's, um, um, that is a sort of value, um, but it's a very real dystopia. <laughs> that we're living in um, is not utopian. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Sai, you wanna take over? Sure, thanks, Hussein. Um, and thanks so much to Lalita and um, Ratula and Tis for bringing us together. Um, uh, so, so Bob, Asha, uh, Mike um, laid out Polanyi in great detail. So, so what I'll do with the five or so minutes that I have is, is let me just illustrate um, through the empirical case that I presented in the book, uh, Land Fictions. Um, and, and I'll focus on the socio-legal category, the socio-legal fiction of wasteland, which is what my book, uh, book chapter focused on. And, and the, the, the book focuses on, uh, the book chapter focuses on a constituency that those of you in Bombay are extremely familiar with. It's the property uh, constituency of Maratha Kundis uh, of agrarian origins, uh, who are now in this very particular moment, uh, making their foray or trying to make a foray into a post 1991 liberalizing and urbanizing society, right? So the recommodification of their agricultural land, and the point to note is it's the recommodification of their agricultural land, right? Agricultural land had severe restrictions. It was one of the most protected commodities 
uh, in the pre-1980s uh, era, but it was a commodity nonetheless. The re-commodification of their agricultural land into new forms of urban enclosures, into SEZs, gated communities, logistics hubs, is as much a question of agrarian property as it is of urban property. So in the chapter, I focus on the enclosure and revaluation of the so-called quote-unquote wasteland into an SEZ um, in the Pune region, the Kade SEZ. Now, this, this socio-legal category of wasteland has very important colonial genealogies, right? So Vinay Gidwani, for instance, has written about the waste value property triad, uh, and he argues that the category of wasteland vests in the empire's seeing of wasteland as revenue wasteland. So in the chapter, I track the revaluation of wasteland uh, of the social category of wasteland through successive uh, post-colonial modernization programs, including the Green Revolution and now the post-1991 um, market and urban turn, right? So that's the broad gist of the chapter. But what I do want to focus now, and I'm going to end with a question that actually dovetails with Bob's earlier uh, comment, uh, but what I'm interested in is the puzzles which are implicated in these fictions of waste, right? And one of the puzzles that emerges in the particular region of Western Maharashtra that, uh, that, that I work in is, is through long histories of colonial and post-colonial development, agrarian dominant castes have appropriated the most valuable and fertile agricultural land, right? And the quote unquote waste land, land with little or um, no revenue yields, um, has been relegated to largely subaltern Adivasi and Dalit laboring groups. Now, one would expect that at this moment of revaluing land, agrarian propertied elites like the Maratha Kundi landowners would be front runners in the commodification of their lands. Right? And yet the agrarian elites in Polanyan terms are seeking a counter movement. They're seeking to protect their agricultural land from new market exposures. Right? And equally surprisingly, in this particular region, Adivasi owners of marginal wasteland for various reasons associated with anti-caste eman uh, emancipatory political projects are becoming willing participants of wasteland commodification. Right? So, so the question then is, as agrarian castes and classes are folded into the massive juggernaut of urbanization, how is the revaluation of landed property settling on, but also unsettling prior caste and power hierarchies? Right? So that's, that's the question. That's the question that I try and address in the chapter. But I think there's a bigger uh, conceptual and political question here that I just wanted to lay out. Um, and I'll actually end with this. And I hope we can pick this up in the discussion because I think it has... Uh, uh, very important political and intellectual stakes for the land struggles that are ongoing now. Uh, and, and this bigger conceptual and political question is this, right? If agrarian landed property is implicated in India's processes of urbanization, agrarian landed property in India is peculiar, right? Precisely because it traces back to colonial revenue regimes India never achieved the property form of bourgeois private property that dominates in much of the West. Right? So land in India is tenured, but it's untitled. Or to be more precise, there's presumptive title. Uh, and I can get into this in the discussion. Right? So we have to focus on this very specific post-colonial nature of tenured but untitled land in India if we are to make sense of some of the puzzles which are emerging in this current iteration of land commodification uh, in India, right? And this directly goes to Bob's point because Bob was talking about stories and the multiple stories, right? The very, very specific um, historically and geographically variegated trajectories of capitalism within landed property, very specific forms of landed property emerge, right? And in India, we really have to deal with this very, very uh, uh, specific post-colonial nature of, of landed property, which is untitled, right? So, so, so let me just uh, stop here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank 
Okay. Um, thank you, Sai and Michael. Um, I really enjoyed reading both your chapters. Um, both of them are great uh, illustrations of historical sociology and um, reveal the embeddedness of land uh, in, again, in Polanyan terms in non market institutions, the social barriers to disembedding, and the complex dynamics of the commodification process. It was also interesting for me personally because I could read so many interesting uh, parallels with uh, land privatization and commodification process in Mumbai, even though it's a highly urban context, um, a metropolitan context. So I have um, um, a couple of questions uh, for both of you. So both of you speak about counter movements to commodification. Uh, what is interesting is that um, in your analysis is the uneven effects of commodification and the role of property constituents in erecting, protecting barriers for themselves, as well as in the role of the state in diffusing opposition by absorbing some groups into the commodification process, as uh, Michael pointed out. Um, however, it's interesting that Polanyi actually, and I, this is, I mean, close to what Michael was saying, is that uh, Polanyi never speaks about counter movements in the plural, but in the singular as a counter movement. And it seems that Polanyi's argument is at a higher level of abstraction uh, at a society wide counter movement to commodification. And I mean, in a sense, it's not surprising writing 1944 um, in his account, uh, this was probably what he was seeing at that time in the form of socialist and fascist forms of counter movement to commodification, perhaps. So, um, so, uh, so my question really is that. Uh, is there really a value to Polanyi's framework uh, of a counter movement, except Michael, the way you say, in a more, uh, except in a more finer grained reading of different kinds of, you know, processes of accommodation, co-option, resistance, and so on to the commodification process. Um, and just to kind of um, uh, add on to that, um, the okay. So let's first. I mean, um, very quickly get your responses and then maybe I'll ask the other one, which is a little more normative. So, yeah. Sai, would you like to go first? Right. Sure, and I just very briefly uh, respond to this, Hussein. It's, it's the question of, um, uh, Polanyi is, uh, is important and, and I really do have to, um, uh, a big, big shout out to Bob Lake, who's been a wonderful mentor, not only to Lalita, but also, but also to me. Um, and, and some of the close reading uh, of Polani is thanks to, to, to Bob. But it's, it's, it's really the realization that the counter movement does not always uh, uh, vest in subaltern struggles, right? Uh, and Polani has an extremely important footnote. And that was, that, that's what I was trying to highlight uh, in my chapter. Uh, that very often, um, and this is equally true for the time that Polanyi was, was writing at a time of an economic uh, downturn, uh, that counter movements and protection, state protection, active state protection from market exposures are sought by some of the most powerful uh, groups in society, right? So, so in that sense, and, and I would argue that, of course, the agrarian property elites that I'm talking about are, are the middle caste, right? So this is what M.N. Srinivas would call the dominant caste. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the monetization of, of land, and in some ways, the capture of land rent, right, during the urbanization of the countryside, is, is also a way of resisting Brahmin Baniya uh, capital, right? Because a lot of the real estate developers, including Loda, very, very powerful in Bombay, um, is, is Brahmin, uh, is Baniya capital, right? So, 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 the, so, the, so the, uh, the, the, the middle class are not the most uh, powerful uh, groups in society, but it's still a very, very important point to highlight that they, as opposed to the subaltern groups, are seeking state protections at this time of uh, new allocation of land rights, but most importantly, risks associated with the commodification of land. Right? Yeah, I would just sort of, I mean, I, I think I sort of said the, the, the bulk of my answer here, which is that I think this, this idea of course, resonates. The, the broad carapace of the idea of double movement 
right? It just resonates that there's that there's com- there's a new round of commodifying everything, and what Polanyi you know tunes us to in a way that Marx doesn't is the way the commodif- not just labor exploitation, but the commodification of everything creates all these different kinds of dislocations and, and movements. But that is really it, you know. And if you really look in, um, you know, the in in the Great Transformation, Polanyi doesn't even have an example. <laughs> Um, you know, of land being re-embedded or decommodified. You know, he actually talks about tariffs for corn, but that's not actually decommodifying land. Um, and um, he's very vague, of course, you know, this is frustrates generation after generation of Plani readers is that, you know, he sees society, this is the Durkheimian element of it in Polanyi. He sees society protecting itself through the medium of classes, <laughs> right? It's not like, but it has the side of society as a whole that protects itself in this kind of way, right? Um, and if we're actually going to understand the, you know, land struggles as counter movements that do emerge or don't emerge and who drives them in different places, um, he just can't give us much of anything. I mean, he says, you know, in some places, enlightened reactionaries, he can't make up his mind about the peasants. Sometimes they go one way, sometimes the other, and so on. Um, you know, and the one thing I would say just empirically is that there's no, nothing you can say in general terms about whether it's the sort of dominant caste, the big landowners, or the small landowners, the Dalits that are resisting or accommodating. There's just huge variation empirically across India. And, you know, I think that requires a fine-grained comparative sociology that both, I think, to me, the big factors there are, one, you have to look at what's the form of dispossession, because that sort of changes the calculation of how people look at a project. And then you have very distinct agrarian social structures that, you know, um, have different, ca- that are, you know, in which different caste hierarchies are, are very kind of embedded. And you have to look at factors like, you um, you know, land tenure, you have to look at the productivity of agriculture, you have to look at um, uh, uh, the very qualitative nature of different agrarian social structures, which we know vary tremendously, and political histories, right? So look at their interaction of forms of dispossession and different agrarian social structures. And I think that comparative scholarship is very necessary and is only very incipient. Most of the work out there is sort of like, I studied this one place, and there's all, and, you know, here's my term and concept. And, you know, it's not really sort of building those comparative insights, but I think that's the direction, at least the scholarship on this needs to move. All right. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so my um, next question, which is a little more normative um, before we go to the audience Q&A. Um, so the whole basis of institutions that govern land for most of human history was based on mutual obligation, custom, tradition. And even though these arrangements did not presuppose equality, they did allow land to be valued in multiple ways. And as uh, both of you kind of uh, show so effectively in your chapters, um, that to treat land as a commodity requires extracting it from its social entanglements and values, uh, which creates barriers to commodification. To overcome these barriers requires a powerful course of apparatus, which is usually the state, um, both to transform the way land functions as well as to justify transformation as beneficial to society. So the counter movements that we are witnessing everywhere uh, are contingent on social conditions, avenues for organization, as well as political constraints. But perhaps we can make a distinction between two kinds of counter movements to commodification. One of managing commodification as a social problem, which really informs the subject of both your chapters um, as to how the barriers can be tackled, barriers to commodification can be tackled while preventing structural challenge to commodification process itself. And the second kind of counter movement that strives for decommodification as a goal of political struggle. Um, So do you see the possibility of re-embedding land in democratic institutions, not simply as a way of selectively protecting interests of certain groups or property groups, but also as a way of overcoming the contradictions of property itself. And what would such a counter movement look like? Can we think of or learn from examples in the past or in the present uh, in from different places? Uh, If you would like to probably talk a little bit about that. (laughs) 
side you want me to go or you want to go anything like okay so go for it um yeah the well, well, look, you know, the way I do see the, the counter movement, the, the anti-dispossession struggles is that there are some that actually refuse to negotiate. I mean, there still are a bunch in India, right? And actually, if you look at China, you actually see a lot less of that, but it's unclear if that's just because in that context, that political context, it's not possible. But in India, you still see a lot of movements that say, we're not going to give our land. All right. And then you see, of course, a lot, you know, in the, especially in peri-urban areas that are um, negotiating, you know, for a higher stake. And of course, um, and they might still fight militantly with the same tactics. And of course, there's so many examples, I don't need to tell you about it. And, um, but that's the sort of goal, right, is to increase the compensation. And, you know, that, um, so I think we can make that sort of distinction within the, um, you know, movements. But then, you know, at the state level, of course, um, what happened with Lara was that at a certain point, these you know, uh, resistances pose enough of a problem for capital accumulation that the state stepped in and said, we need to do something. We need to try to coordinate some kind of, you know, compromise here on the terrain of com commodification so we can keep this thing going. So we can keep, we can basically rescue this regime of dispossession that's politically tenuous. And we're going to do it by, you know, increasing compensation of farmers. Uh, and of course, you know, they tried to, <laughs> Ramesh tries to do that and the chambers of commerce push back and all the states push back. I and mean, we get a very diluted bill that then is basically quickly thrown out the window again when the next government comes in and so on. And so it's not clear that they succeeded, but that is sort of, I think, you know, if you wanted to locate that in Polanyi, that's the sort of Polanyi part where the state comes in and, you know, but, but the way I see it is that it, that's, it's really just trying to, and this is where I just think you know, the planning terms are limiting, but it's an attempt to kind of rescue a neoliberal regime of dispossession by creating a stronger material basis of compliance, right? Um, you can't just say sacrifice for the nation anymore when you're giving land to reliance for, you know, whatever. Um, you need to pay up more. And the old sort of act was just not doing that anymore, right? It had a legitimacy crisis and this is the answer. And whether that works or not is, I mean, they're not even trying it. So, <laughs> but that's a comparative question. I guess the only thing I would say is that, um, you know, in terms of challenging actually, you know, I think, look, the, the, the point, this is where Polanyi is not good either. It's that what dispossession is, is upward redistribution. Um, and to me, the question is how at a certain point do you stop just kind of fighting for that or trying to, you know, get some crumbs thrown back, um, you know, at you, given this sort of larger trend of upward redistribution, can you actually get to a point where, you know, you have militant struggle for downward redistribution? I mean, I know it's hard. I mean, it's hard to, it seems far off the political horizon, but I mean, that's to me, what's <laughs> What's interesting is not just sort of like, can you have the right to be dispossessed fairly, right, with higher compensation, but can you actually reverse the direction of dispossession? So, yeah, thanks for that question, Hussein. It's, 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 it's an important one. Um, in, in, in my book, I perhaps a little too uh, uh, naively uh, vest a lot of hope in this new democratic institution called the Grand Sabha, right? And of course, there are lots of problems with the with the Gram Sabha. Some would argue it comes out of uh, very liberal imaginations of the democratic state, right? So points all very, very well taken. Uh, but at the same time, I think he was a student of this, uh, Mahesh Rawat, uh, who's been imprisoned as one of the Bhima Koregao um, um, quote unquote rioters. Um, and and to me, uh, uh, Rawat's work is, and he's he's very young. He's in he's in he's he's in his thirties, right? And and to me, the reason why someone like Rawat is um, a threat, a huge threat um, uh, to the authoritarian regime of the BJP, uh, is because he was trying to mobilize uh, Gram Sabhas in Eastern Maharashtra, right? So there's something very, very potent uh, uh, in these new democratic uh, institutions that we are seeing. Yes, they're fraught with a lot of problems, but the very fact that the BJP uh, sees a Mahesh Rawat as a threat because he's mobilizing uh, the Gram Sabha says something about the democratic uh, potential of the Gram Sabha, right? So that as a democratic institution uh, and particularly a local democratic institution, right? Um, I, I think it's worth paying attention to. You know, the, 
the one point, and, and I'm, I'm not going to go back to my closing uh, uh, remark, because I, I do think we need to pay attention to the fact that commodified land in India, right, real estate in India, uh, real estate townships like Magarpata are deeply embedded in social relations. They're not, uh, they're deeply embedded in relations of caste. Right? So they're deeply, deeply embedded in exclusionary caste and social relations, which goes to uh, a very important point about uh, the way in which caste is mobilized for the making of real estate markets. Right, So these are markets in the making that are embedded, uh, uh, to go back to uh, Eric Hotspawn, this is an invention of tradition, right? where caste is mobilized in new ways, for the making of real estate markets. You know, it was striking to me when I was doing my uh, doctoral research and, and a group of sugarcane uh, farmers, and these were all small farmers, right? Some of them uh, were marginal farmers. They owned less than uh, two hectares of irrigated land. They were willing to give up their land, their sugarcane fields, and to become shareholders in a real estate company, right? And through discussions, they vested their hope in this real estate company because of their caste affinities of being Maratha Kundi, right? Uh, so, so I think this is a very, very uh, important point that commodified land, particularly urbanizing uh, real estate in India is deeply embedded in social relations, albeit in, um, uh, very exclusionary caste social relations. You know, and, and if I could just ask one question, largely because we have uh, the privilege of this being a transnational panel, right? We have Asha and Bob in New Jersey. And New Jersey, of course, you know, so one of the fictions that you were talking about, um, when I mean, you were talking about uh, fictions, Hussein, and one of the fictions, one of the stories that's circulating with increased velocity is this is this dream world of having the Trump Tower in your city, right? And that's that's a fiction in the making. And particularly important because the former president, the, 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 the part of the real estate mafia of Donald Trump, Trump comes out of the region where Asher and Bob Lake are, right? And but but to me, the question is: how do you read in tandem the making of a Trump Tower in New York? which has a very, very different property regime with the making of a Trump Tower in Pune or Mumbai, right? Which have very different land regimes, right? I remember, I remember in 2015, um, uh, during Trump's uh, uh, visit, talking to some investors in Bombay, and they said Trump just threw his hands up in the air, right? And he was like, how is anyone going to build any luxury real estate in India because the land here is not fungible? Right? And this goes back to the question of the historic specificity of the property form of land right? um, and, and the kinds of frictions posed by the uh, tenured but untitled land in India. And really this question of how do you read in tandem the Trump Tower in New York with the Trump Tower um, in Bombay? Right? Okay, uh, thank you so much for these uh, great uh, and most insightful thoughts. So, you know, I was thinking while reading the book that um, there are so many different ways in which commodification is narrated and justified. Uh, Sai, for instance, you talk about the narrative of wasteland and the conflation of categories of land with categories of personhood. I thought that was really uh, very, very interesting. Similarly, in the chapter by uh, Christopher's and uh, Whiteside, they show how the fiction of surplus enables privatization of public land. Uh, it's also very intriguing how ubiquitous these narratives uh, are. For instance, in Mumbai, we're told that land is scarce, and hence we need greater development intensities to go higher to compensate for the scarcity. On the other hand, public land is deemed as surplus uh, and privatized to address the problem of housing infrastructure and so on. So the narrative of surplus and scarcity uh, are held simultaneously and both are believed. You know? uh, so this sort of double think um, makes uh, marketable land grow, not just vol volumetrically, vertically, but also horizontally uh, through the region. Um, and um, so critical urban scholarship has developed a range of concepts to talk about this process, commodification, privatization, monetization of land, financialization, even fiscalization, uh, which is basically using land as a fiscal tool or a policy tool. So every one of these processes accompanies its own set of fictions and it's um, 
uh, interesting to, uh, to, to to try to understand and make sense of uh, these uh, processes of uh, you know what uh, Asher refers to as uh, social stories that people tell. Um, so I was wondering if uh, there is a sequel planned to this book, which could also be very interesting, um, and uh, maybe that's uh, a, a suggestion more than a question. Um, but I think we have a little more than half an hour so i guess we'll open it up for uh, an audience uh, for the audience q and a and lots of people who might be very eager to ask lots of questions so anyone wants to ask a question to anybody please feel free you could also um, type your questions in the chat and i'll read it out to the panelists So there's a question from Sahil. Um, my question circulates around the fictions that prevail. Even the social meanings of land or land as nature are themselves fictions, and yet the only certain and yet only certain fictions prevail, which often is often imposed by the state, which is itself an effect of all of these relations. So I think uh, I guess the question is um, which what kind of fictions prevail and what kind of fictions don't. Anyone would like to take that question? Asher, Bob, Sai, Michael. Um, I can say something, I'm sure. Or Bob, why don't you jump in and then I'll follow. Well, very quickly, I would say that uh, the fiction fictions that work at uh, fictions pr that prevail are the fictions that work. Uh, 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 where where uh, Michael referred to to some of Polanyi's discussion as as functionalist, but I think if we recognize that the underlying driver of the entire process is profitability, uh, whether it whether it's in microeconomic terms or in Marxist terms of capital accumulation. Uh, then, then there is a continuous process of trial and error, of, of, of the suggestion of, of strategies and institutional arrangements. Uh, and, and the ones that stick are the ones that are functional for the purpose of maximizing profitability or, 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 or the accumulation of capital, depending on which, which school of thought you want to subscribe to. Um, and it's a constant process of, of there, there are, we, don't, we don't remember or think about the arrangements that don't stick, that don't prevail, uh, because they don't stick around and, and not enough subjects are enrolled uh, according to those terms. Um, but, uh, but this is, again, why uh, it's very difficult to generalize or to reduce this to a simple uni-logical, is that a word? Uh, uh, a, a, a singular logic that prevails in every case because different arrangements will prevail in different contexts. I think the, the, the point that, that Sai was emphasizing, I think um, very clearly. Yeah, thanks. I, th um, I have a couple of responses. The first, I think just comes back to Mike's point. I think that our engagement with the concept of land fictions, um, uh, you know, treating treating the thinking carefully about the performative power of narrative, I, I, I read it as entirely compatible with the Polanyian theory of fictitiousness that Mike helps um, helps us elaborate. Right, treating land as embedded within social and eco ecological relations. That are prior to market formation and commodification. And our claim is that fiction is the work of explaining the need for the justification for those forms of state intervention, those forms of extra economic force, those forms of violence. And in this sense, it's like us kind of coming back to fiction is the ideological work necessary to drive this process of property um, formation. And so I think, you know, Sahil's question of when it's state backed or has this, this, this political basis, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, 
The question of how fictions travel and why certain ones prevail has to do in part with what we, I think we lay this out in the intro in part where we're thinking about the, the, that fictions often have a kind of citationary structure. They have an iterability to them. The more that they're spoken, the more that they're told, the more that they're narrated, the more convincing they become and the more likely they are to circulate and find grounding even in highly disparate contextual uh, situations, right? So how they are restated and the way in which they posit a particular kind of narrative structure. So there's a crisis that, that begins the story, a climax, and a resolution of sorts. So land, we know then, is like commonly characterized as in surplus or as waste, as you were just saying, Hussein. It's underutilized in some way. So what's the climax? It's sold and transformed into a better use. And the resolution is it finds some productive or more efficient, you know, uh, arrangement. Um, and this is, I think, where Trump comes in too. Urban land is is somehow ordinary or lacks the spectacular. It needs to become a triumphant symbol of success. It needs a star architect, designer, or a charismatic demigod like developer, which leads to this image, this constructed image of Trump in New York, that then can be mapped onto a set of illegible or difficult to, to penetrate urban relations in Pune that somehow spins this story of, right, you know, the art of the deal, the guy who's going to get the job done. And the fact that it fails is, is interesting and really important. But then what allows it then to repit, you know, what, what kind of political mobilization would have been necessary for it not to have succeeded in Pune or in the NCR, right? The, you know, what, what kind of fictions or tales were needed to, 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 to block that. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's really interesting. So for me, the question that Mike asked of, you know, what militant, what, what kind of stories do we need to think of militant struggles for, I think you call it downward redistribution, right? And I think part of that is about developing tools for narrating what non-commodified or less wholly commodified land is or can do or narrating these accounts of, land, of, of, of property's failure at the same time. And so part of, this isn't the chapter that I wrote for, for land fictions, but other, other work that I've been doing, thinking especially with, you know, Solly Benjamin, who I was here a little while ago, is about, you know, looking at the, the space of non-privatized land tenures in an urban context, thinking about, you know, the space of the slum in Delhi, in my case, and not necessarily sort of glorifying it as some utopian non-commodified space, because it certainly isn't that, but thinking about the forms of relationality that attach to that and, 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 and articulating forms of positive attributes. How do we narrate what that does in the face of capitalist territorialization? To me, that is a part of constructing a narrative, not of a militant downward redistribution, but one that at least potentially, I hope, holds as a kind of block or blockade even against um, the dystopia that Mike, I think, is right to say is 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 all around us. Okay, um, I think we have a question from. Uh, we have two questions, one in the chat, and uh, but Amita uh, has raised her hand. Um, uh, go ahead. Do you want me to go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, these were such great presentations and have been just so deeply thought provoking that I think that's why when you asked whether there were any questions, there was a bit of a stunned silence. But uh, just thinking along with you uh, about how we can use Polyani and apply uh, that work to these questions, um, I was thinking, you know, what are the fictions that we can get behind? And perhaps one of those social constructs that we need to reclaim is the, the doubleness of the state in the sense that many of us have spent most of our careers sort of uh, you know, deconstructing the state's notion of public interest, eminent domain, showing how deeply um, you know, dominated these are to allow certain forms of appropriation. But since the state through its various agencies, still remains the biggest landowner in India. Uh, you know, the Forest Department, in Delhi, the DDA, the railways. 
there is still a lot of land with the state that is not commodified and of course we focused quite naturally because you know it's been the big a uh, sort of signal departure from the 1990s on the state acting as a broker it there is still so much that the state uh, still does in its form as a landowner and i was therefore and i see you know for instance the ecologists now make the argument that uh, that a lot of what we call waste land should now uh, be uh, appreciated as open natural ecosystems and that the state is therefore vested with conserving these on ecological grounds so um in polyani's work and in your engagement with uh, polyani uh, the fact that the state's role is contradictory and reflects all the tensions and that exist in society do you think there's any hope at all uh, of using the idea of public interest positively in order to stop uh, what mike calls dispossession which is redistribution upwards i can have something to say but i th- i would love bob to um jump in in part because i think the his chapter is thinking specifically about the way it, it's it's not india it's but it's thinking of new jersey the specific ways that public interest was mobilized in a particular moment having to do with the 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 renewal of 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 camden in the context of a deep crisis of indian deindustrialization um and that took a less <laughs> utopian turn let's say just cuz i know bob we bob hasn't got a chance to speak about the the empirics of his his case at all yeah i would just quickly in in response to your your question about is there a possibility for uh the state to to play i guess what we might think of as a positive role here uh the possibility is always there the probability depends on to 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 overly generalized the political right that 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 is this is a political question it's not a structural question it's not a uh it's not a phenomenological question it's a political question and in some instances uh the state as a collective institution can be mobilized in, uh, toward toward one end or another in one direction or another and and whether it will be and how it will be depends on the outcome of that ongoing political contestation um the, so again the possibility is always there but you know in in the US I mean I can talk about the Camden case if we have several hours but uh quickly you know I think that what's become apparent in recent years and in, in the last decade or so probably more in the US is is um the political pressure toward privatization right the 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 movements in the western part of the US to privatize public land to uh uh prioritize uh, private use over public use the uh, uh political mobilization from the right to privatize national parks the argument from the Milton Friedmans of the world that if we need that if there's enough consumer demand for national parks uh we will have them and if there isn't then they should go away right and 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 that argument tends to get a lot of traction certainly in certain quarters and if anything by my reading is becoming more ascendant rather than less so um I guess my answer would be it depends. I wish I had a better answer also to meet this question. Um because of course, you know, it immediately just makes me be you know, go back to the problem which you're asking us to <laughs> move beyond, which is of course that the public interests and private interests have been totally conflated, right? And that's what, you know, 
using eminent domain for private companies has done. Now, of course, I think, and, and you know, you, that's also in, in the US, of course, with New London. And I'm just looking into these laws around pipelines in the US. In, in, in the US and Louisiana and in, in many states, the, the um, government has delegated, not just, they're not just acquiring land for private companies. They've delegated to those private companies <laughs> the ability to do eminent domain to build a pipeline, which is considered in the public interest. When of course, it is the public global interest to not build pipelines, right? And so how do we begin to sort of uh, reclaim the idea of a public interest from this sort of equation with you know, uh, private interests, which create profit, which is what growth is, right? So, um, you know, I think in India that what the land struggles, you know, suggests is that that idea is not hegemonic entirely, right? Um, and in fact, you know, you can't actually convince a lot of people that it's in the public interest to sort of take farmers' lands for a private company. That's why they have to pay up. But can that sort of, you know, um, residual notion of a public interest, which I think was obviously very strong in the Nehruvian period, you know, can that be rearticulated in some way around a different vision of, you know, reclaiming commons and, and so on. Now, of course, the other problem is it sort of is a two-way struggle here, right? There's one, you know, uh, can you protect the commons from the state and privatization? On the other hand, there's a struggle within the agrarian milieu <laughs> over those commons. And, um, and of course, they're always appropriated almost always by the upper caste and so on. And I'm, I'm very interested, there's a, you know, um, in these struggles that are happening, like in Punjab to, you know, to uh, Dalit movements to reclaim those. Um, most of what I know about it is from uh, incoming student we have, Amal Singh, has been doing research on this. Very interesting. I mean, I, I'm very interested in that, but it's a very, it's, <laughs> this is, and this is why, again, the Polanyi piece is inadequate ultimately, right? Because it can lead itself to this romantic idea of, oh, you know, have the, the peasantry that are commoners and they're defending the commons against the onslaught of capital, when, of course, we know what agrarian social structures are like based on deep caste and class domination. So there's the kind of different kind of double move, I guess, right? It's sort of the, the movement vis-a-vis -vis capital and, the, and then the, the, the sort of struggle in, in, that is interior to agrarian social milieu. And so that's a very difficult one to figure out how to build a, you know, a politics um, and a political coalition around decommodifying land, but in a way that maintains a conception of class and caste struggle, you know? Um, anti-caste struggle and class struggle. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I think that's great. I agree with that. But I think also part of your question, Amita, is thinking to some extent about sort of different traditions of the public and, 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 and where they come from and how they can be mobilized. And what I think is interesting is some of the ways in which public's past can be rethought and re, 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 reimagined in the present. Um, so part of what I've been thinking about in terms of diverse land tenures in the context of busties and slums is about sort of like re, 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 re enlivening a kind of sense of an urban laboring class and the kinds of land relations that have been made in the context of severe constraint. But just thinking of the kind of agrarian class and caste fractures that Mike's speaking of, and this is probably because in a couple, we haven't seen the film yet, but in a couple of days um, here at Rutgers, we're having a screening of Chala Una, the film by Ujwal Utkarsh, um, which I don't know if, 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 I don't know if folks here have seen it. So I really, I really um, am reluctant <laughs> to speak about it too, too much, but I'm, I'm struck by in the context of you know, however many years ago it was, um, and especially now in, the, in this moment, where um, you know the arrest of, of Mimani and all of this, that the part of the mobilization there, and I'm remembering specifically the the, the cow, the, the protest around the cow, and when when um, when the the cow carcasses were dumped in front of I forget one of the the, the collectorate, uh, but there there was this moment when. Um, part of the mobilization was specifically tied not only to the rejection of stigmatized labor and degrading work, but also to the demand for uh, stopping, slowing or reversing the encroachment of the grazing lands, the Goucher, the Goucher lands. And so this to me is a moment of a particular kind of, of peri-urban, Dalit anti-caste political mobilization here mobilized in part in the I mean, I, I, again, I'm reluctant to speak to this too much, but like 
there's a there's a maybe a strategic mobilization of the ecology of the of the region the fact that cows are eating all of this plastic it's damaging them they're dying and we're the ones left to it why is this happening it's because upper caste encroachment and capitalist encroachment on this former wasteland basically and so to me that is a kind of mobilization that is a that is a claiming of the of, of a kind of public and in this case, a particularly, I would say, anti-caste ecological commons. Um, again, I'm not sure of the full politics of this, so it's not something that I've studied, but I'm just struck by it in the context of, of, of this particular moment of, you know, that's a that's a that 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 grazing land is of a is of a much older legacy, and yet it endures both as an actual space, as a material something that's being confined and encroached and being lost, but also something that's being revitalized as something that's considered of ecological value, social value, political value. So um, not to say that that's the future, but I think it's, it's one interesting case for it in, that comes to mind at least. Just um, quickly add um, to Amita's question on the public's um, in the plural interest. Um, I mean, one, another way um, another way in which we can think about this is, of course, um, linking the public's interest um, to the social life of laws, right? And again, laws in the plural, because exactly like you said, Amita, there are uh, the, the, the eminent domain uh, doctrine of the railways, which is the largest landowner in the country, is very different from LARA, is very different from uh, the Forest Rights Act. Right. Um, and, and these laws, these land laws um, in the plural, again, have very different genealogies. So Anand Vaidya has um, written a wonderful uh, uh, dissertation. I hope it's uh, published very soon into a book on the genealogy of the Forest Rights Act. Right. Which really for the first time. And, and of course, he's not overly romantic about the Forest Rights Act. He does talk about the, the legal indeterminacy. Of, of the law, uh, but it's a very, very important point that it is a landmark law, right? Because for the first time it decriminalizes uh, decades old criminalization of forest dwellers and grants uh, land rights uh, or, or at least possibilities um, for uh, legal claims making to forest dwellers. And that of course is very, very different from one of the first scholars who introduced himself uh, in the chat box is from Kashmir. And I'll have to just scroll up uh, uh, to, 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 to go back to the scholar's name uh, and the kind of internal colonialism that we're seeing in India and really the land grabs in internally colonized Kashmir, right? So in some ways, I think it's worth thinking about the social life of the laws in the plural and how they relate to the public's interest. Um, and just one final plug for a really wonderful piece of work that's come out of CPR. It's by a legal uh, scholar called uh, Namita Vahi, where she's been mapping India's thousand land laws. Right? And it really just gives you the sense of political possibilities uh, when you start looking at these very different genealogies of, of land struggles, right? And the ways in which they relate to the state and to the law. So there are a number of comments in the in the and questions in the chat about yeah. the idea of, of counter move. I was just thinking, Asha, I was just thinking I could probably try to combine two questions uh, because we have uh, exactly 10 minutes left. Um, so there's one question by Rohit Lahoti, who talks, about, who asks about um, how can um, land frictions around commodification of, affect security of tenure in informal settlements? Um, often tenure security can play an interest in play out in an interesting manner if land is owned collectively or individually, or when the ownership itself is contested. With Karen Kolo's question about I'm wondering what sort of fictions are mobilized in regularization of land, which arises from a political logic that is quite different from that of profit. Uh, so regular, regularization also as a way of making property. I don't know if they're really um, connected as questions, but I thought maybe uh, um, any of you could respond to uh, either of them. Yeah, I think I spoke a little bit to the, the 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 first one, so maybe I'll just turn to the regularization question here. So my chapter in the book is actually about um, 
the fictions of, of, of planning and planning law, specifically in the context of the regularization of unauthorized colonies in Delhi. And here it's again thinking um, less, uh, it's, 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 it's less thinking of fictions in the Polanyan sense of commodity or non-commodity and more about regulatory fictions or the terms on which cities are governed and administered. And here I'm looking at specifically the way that planning itself operates as a fiction, as a, as a means by which uh, the kind of historically core planned areas of the city continue to be asserted as that which is planned and regular and the outside uh, of the unauthorized urban majority um, continues to be framed right as, as, as the exception. And so that, that chapter is specifically um, no, I wouldn't. So it, it is just looking at your comment, Karen, regularization also as a way of making property. It's it's I agree with that, that it's it's a way in which um, planning kind of gets played upon itself to produce that which was outside of planning and unrecognized as as something closer to formal property, even while the distinction between the planned and the unplanned is sort of maintained. And so the chapter looks at these three spaces, uh, the space of, of the, 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 the plan itself, the way that land use designation and urban um, neighborhood layouts are made. It looks at um, water infrastructure and it looks at um, the, the site of the unauthorized building. And it thinks through specifically um, fictions of the, the original planned and it's outside or it's mimic or it's copy. And I basically look at, I guess the gist of, of, of the argument there is that the, um, is, is that what happens by the end through this regularization process is that the plan, the formal domain of planning ends up mimicking its outside through the, the act of having to create this cloak of formality around that which the plan itself says doesn't belong. And so you have to upgrade, upgrade water systems to match, um, to, to match the, the regular. You have to, uh, and I look at the ways at the end, how even planned colonies increasingly are mimicking the unauthorized outside uh, through illegal extensions. Um, so yeah, I think it's a play on... Um, I'm just looking at your your question again. Um, yeah, is it is it a, is it a logic that's different from profit? That that part I'm I'm less convinced of. I think it, it's 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 an alternative mechanism of of property formation, um, one that is bypassing the the legacies of formal planning, but but still motivated towards property consolidation. And I think logic's a profit. So it seems to me that a lot of these questions coalesce around the, the larger question of, of, of what counts as a counter movement, right? And, and how to think about this idea, that, or maybe think about how does Polanyi think about his idea of the counter movement. And I think, you know, clearly there's a lot of room for interpretation in Polanyi. But I think it's important to, to, to emphasize that uh, at least my reading of Polanyi is that he pre he presents the idea uh, not of not only of a counter movement but of a double movement, right? A double movement through which the commodity form and the market uh, system uh, expands in, uh, and becomes embedded in society, right? And and his argument in the double movement is that on the one hand there is the expansion of the market through the increasing marketization and commodification dynamics that we've discussed, right? And then there is the counter movement, which is uh, the attempt by uh, whether it's, it's um, uh, local movements or the state or informal or formal practices, the counter movement to ameliorate the negative effects of the the initial expansion of the market, right? And that both arms of the double movement contribute to the expansion of the commodity form and the market dynamic. And, and, it, and, and, and too often, I think, 
this becomes defined in terms of an expansion and a contraction or an expansion and a, uh, a den expansion of the market and uh, undermining of the market. And I think that's very different from Polanyi's argument, which is that both sides, both arms of the double movement contribute to the market ex expansion and the expansion of commodification. And that what we can look at these state interventions uh, of the sort that, that, that uh, are described in the case studies, the, um, uh, uh, the, the small um, uh, grants of land that Michael describes uh, that essentially bought off uh, the potential for opposition, the uh, um, other kinds of the, in Polanyi's case, the, the um, uh, uh, subsidy of the price of bread, the, the role of the tutor, he cites, the role of the tutor and steward kings to slow down and ameliorate the negative effects of uh, collective uh, 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 of the uh, of the privatization of the collective, right? And uh, and these counter movements aren't the opposition or the opposite of commodification. They are the move the, the the interventions that smooth the way for the continued expansion of the market and the commodity form. And if we understand it in that way, then the, those those kinds of counter movements are very different from the experiments and the initiatives that we can all point to that radically change the narrative, that move away from the narrative of commodification in the market in its entirety and advance an alternative narrative that isn't about uh, that in, in any respect. And I think that's, that's a different, that's outside of and beyond the scope of the kinds of counter movement that Polanyi was describing. And I think that's an important, that it's important to maintain that distinction. Maybe I could just um, address Amir's thoughtful question here, um, if that's okay. Um, Amir's asked about, uh, Kashmir yeah. and where there's modification, but a very uh, coercive militarized reaction from the state and so on. So the counter movements can't arise. Um, you know, I, um, that seems to me like an accurate description of, of what's happening. And I, I, I think the way I think about dispossession is that there's basically three ways to, three means to produce compliance to dispossession. There's a sort of brute coercion and the, the coercion is always there you know, to some extent. And what really varies is the extent to which, you know, states can kind of legitimate this as sort of the public interest and, and how much they, you know, offer some material basis for people to comply, you know, compensation and other kinds of things. So um, there's just a lot of variation. And I think, you know, in um, within India, obviously within the pockets of, you know, in much of India where there's a, a at least a kind of nominal democratic openness, right? There are rooms for those movements. They also often get repressed, but they can get traction and, you know, increasingly get political parties to support them and their civil society and so on. And of course, that's not the case in uh, places like Kashmir or parts of the Northeast or, you know, parts of the kind of so-called Maoist belt and so on. Um, and, you know, I've learned a lot by comparing India with China. It's not the same kind of context, but you can see actually what difference it makes, right? When there's... Um, you know, less, uh, you know, room for kind of democratic uh, expression where there's not a civil society is not allowed to, to emerge. Um, it is different. I mean, in, in China, the, um, you know, um, in the, the, there's still actually militant resistance, but they just can't really negotiate over anything except for um, compensation. They can't really form, you can't get like a national alliance of people's movements in China, right? You know, that's not allowed to develop and so on. Um, so all I would say is just that, you know, obviously there are cases where it's, it's, it's much closer to just brute coercion. And I think you're act accurately identifying, you know, one of those places. Okay. Uh, so I guess we are out of time. Um, 
And uh, there's one more question for uh, Asher, but I guess we have to, uh, you know, I, I, could, I would suggest to people to just read uh, Asher's book, Rule by Aesthetics, which is uh, a great read also. Um, so um, once again, thank you everybody for uh, this great conversation. Thank you to uh, uh, TISS for inviting me and um, for also, um, um, I really enjoyed reading the book and I really um, would urge everyone to, um, you know, to get a copy and uh, read, it, read, it, read for themselves all the wonderful contributions and also the very interesting uh, discussion on Polanyi's work and how it is useful to think about uh, some of the questions around land and commodification today. Thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Uh, thank you to Hussein for, you know, really wonderfully um, fielding these questions and um, and putting the round table uh, together, uh, bringing people into conversation. And of course, our audience for being with us. Thank you for a really wonderful, thought-provoking uh, round table.